तो स्टिल मोर एंड मोर डेलीगेट्स आर जॉइनिंग ऑलमोस्ट वी हैव 45 डेलीगेट्स इन टुडे सेशन हेलो 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 रमेश सर इज यस सर वेरी मच आई थिंक देयर इज सम इकोइंग एक्चुअली ऑन द बैकग्राउंड सो टाइम कैन यू जस्ट एडजस्ट द सेटिंग देयर इज सम इकोइंग एक्चुअली this echo from my side oh no now it is okay sir yeah okay. it's fine it's fine yeah so i'll just uh, uh, is, uh, start with the introduction so first of all a very happy onam to everybody and uh, today uh, our 25th of this educational series and uh, the today's topic is very interesting and it is renal replacement therapy for aki so we have with us uh, the eminent speaker sir ramesh sir ramesh venkatraman sir actually sir is a uh, leading consultant critical care medicine apollo hospital chennai and i think his field of interest is only this renal replacement therapy so with this to be very focused on this uh, pg academic activity basically today's session will be an mcq based and uh, i thanks sir for joining today and uh, presenting his session and we definitely uh, be fortunate to have him here in today's our academic program so without further delay i'll just start the session myself dr gunadhar padi i am the senior consultant and the coordinator apollo hospital navi mumbai and with me my colleague dr akhilesh uh, consultant critical care medicine apollo hospital so we welcome sir on the behalf of the apollo hospital navi mumbai and uh, from all the pg students delegates dnb critical care medicine students idccm and without further delay sir i hand over the session to you again i welcome you and please sir you can start sir thank you thank you very much dr gunadhar and team it's a it's a pleasure to be here and having an opportunity to teach trainees uh, just a word of caution i'm recovering from a viral illness so if i have bouts of cough in between please excuse me so just want to give an overview of renal replacement therapy for acute kidney injury in the icu we'll talk about the basic terminology we'll talk about issues related to vascular access we'll talk about issues related to initiation timing of dialysis the modality of dialysis the dose delivery and some technical aspects and how do we terminate dialysis uh, and with that the talk will get over each of these sections will uh, start with an mcq and then the following slides will try to answer that question so that at the end of the slides you will kind of get the answer for the question that i have uh, originally started so let's start with the first question um the term you can just pick the true answers uh, you don't have to necessarily answer but just in your mind uh, read them and just uh, know know what the right answer is and then you can verify it later the term dialysis refers to solute removal through convection uh, if uh, the moderators want people to type it in the chat box it's up to them so but i just thought i'll just go through the choices pick the sentences that are true the first sentence is the term dialysis refers to solute removal through convection Two, the term hemofiltration refers to solute removal through diffusion. Three, fluid removal is done only by ultrafiltration. Four, diffusive clearance provides equal efficacy in clearing small and middle molecules. Five, 
solute clearance by filtration warrants fluid replacement so i'll just give you about 10 seconds for you to read it and then i'll go on okay so let's just talk about how the dialysis actually works a dialysis filter looks like this you have straws of fibers going through a cylinder inside the straw there is blood outside the straw is the dialysate fluid blood and dialysate go in the opposite direction you can see blood going in and coming out dialysate is going in the opposite direction and coming out counter current mechanism so that the exchange is the most efficient only in counter current mechanisms first let's talk about solute clearance solute clearance can happen by two main mechanisms the first mechanism is what we call as diffusion in diffusion there is a concentration gradient dependent movement of solutes across a semi permeable membrane for example blood has a lot of urea dialysate does not have urea so urea diffuses across a concentration dependent gradient when you use a counter current mechanism when solute transport happens in this kind of a mechanism we call it diffusion think of diffusion as making tea you put a tea bag in a hot water and then you make tea that is how diffusion happens right so uh, diffusion uh, that's how clears the solute second part of uh, solute clearance is what we call as filtration in filtration what happens is we have a membrane with blood on one side of the membrane we are going to put a pressure when i put pressure on one side of the membrane there is going to be fluid going out through the small pores in the membrane when lot of fluid goes out it is going to drag a lot of the small particles along and the particle size will depend on the pore size any particle that is smaller than the pore size will also get dragged along by the fluid that goes because of the application of the pressure so in convection this kind of solute clearance is called convection in convection the first prerequisite is you're going to have a transmembrane pressure two you're going to have a lot of fluid going in and this fluid which is also the solvent is going to drag some of the solute across the pores of the membrane and the solute nature would depend on the size of the pores so convection happens when there is a lot of solvent drag with the transmembrane gradient whenever convection happens we use the term hemofiltration whenever diffusion happens we use the term dialysis i told you earlier that diffusion which is dialysis is like making tea here it's make it's like making filter coffee right you put pressure or espresso machine you put pressure on one side there is water going along and along with that coffee particles go along and that's how you make the espresso so making coffee is convection making tea is diffusion every time you do diffusion you call it dialysis when you do convection you call it hemofiltration so solute clearance in hemodialysis happens either by diffusion or by convection and in some modalities you can combine a little bit of convection and a little bit of diffusion as i told you earlier diffusion is going to be predominantly by concentration dependent dependent gradient versus convection is because of solvent drag and the particle size in convection is solely dependent on the pore size if you have a larger pore larger solutes can come out smaller pore smaller solutes can come up so the fundamental difference between diffusive clearance and convective clearance is both are very good for small molecule clearance molecules of small molecular weight like 10 to 100 uh, molecular weight kilo dalton molecular weight versus larger and middle molecules convective clearance is better so there is a school of thought that believes that there are a lot of middle molecules that we may remove in convective clearance that may be of benefit even though we have not been able to characterize one particular molecule people believe there are a lot of middle molecules like inulin that probably have benefit on removal and maybe convection has superiority over diffusion understand that when i am going to do convection i told you the first prerequisite is i need to give a transmembrane pressure then i need to remove a lot of water when lot of water comes out it pulls some amount of solute also 
for me to be able to do significant amount of solute clearance, I need to remove a large amount of water. It is not enough if I remove only 50 ml per hour or 100 ml per hour. I need to remove one liter per hour, two liters per hour, two and a half liters per hour, huge amounts of volume for me to remove the solute. But if I continue to remove that kind of volume, if I remove one and a half liters volume, I will drain the entire cardiac output in three to four hours and patient will not tolerate. So anytime I do convective clearance, I am mandated to replace the volume I am actually removing by the solvent drag. So anytime we use convection, we have to use replacement fluid. The replacement fluid in dialysis can be infused before the dialysis filter. So the blood goes into the dialysis filter, replacement fluid goes before that. Let's say I'm going to remove one liter of filtrate. I already give back that one liter before the, the blood enters the filter. This is called pre-dilution. Or I go through the dialysis machine, remove one liter of ultrafiltrate, but before the blood enters the patient, I give one more liter of fluid here so that the patient's volume status is not compromised. If I give it after the dialysis filter, I call it post-dilution. If I give it before the dialysis filter, I call it pre-dilution. <coughs> what about solvent clearance? Solvent, uh, we talked about solute clearance as either convection or dialysis. Solvent clearance always is done by ultrafiltration. It is exactly similar to what we would do in convection. But remember, if I remove only less amount of fluid, if I want to remove only three liters over six hours, which is only like 500 ml per hour, the amount of solute clearance I will get is not as much as I would get when I do large amounts of ultrafiltrate like I do in convection. So solvent or fluid removal in dialysis is always done by ultrafiltration. Solute removal can be either by convection or by diffusion. When I do convection, I have to replace the fluid either pre-dilution or post-dilution. So ultrafiltrate is used to remove fluid and ultrafiltration rate can be controlled. I can tell the machine how much fluid to remove every hour. Replacement fluid has to be used to sometime get, give back some of the fluid. The CRRT balance is net going in versus net coming out. That makes sense. Patient's fluid down fluid intake output chart will be all the intake and all the output together. So that's how the dialysis system works. So here, let's look at the three major terminologies: CV, VH, continuous veno-venous hemofiltration. The moment I say the word hemofiltration, it is going to be convection. The moment I say it's convection, there has to be a replacement fluid. So you can see that there is access, a return to the patient. There is a filter. The effluent is coming out. Because it is convection, there has to be a replacement fluid either pre or post. Next is CVVHD, continuous veno-venous hemodialysis. Here, it is going to be solute clearance only by diffusion, where I, I'm not removing any fluid for the sake of solute clearance. Yes, I will remove some fluid for fluid removal, but that amount of fluid will not impact the solute removal. So I don't have to necessarily give back replacement fluid. And I can do both together, CVVHDF, continuous veno-venous hemodiafiltration. So it can be pre-dilution, pre post-dilution. Here you are getting both replacement fluid and dialysate because we are doing combined dialysis and uh, hemofiltration. So now let's look at the three modalities, intermittent dialysis, CRRT, and SLED. Fluid removal in all three modalities is always done by ultrafiltration. Solute removal can be done by diffusion in IHD. In CRRT, it can be diffusion, convection, or both, as we saw in the previous slide. SLED, by far, most of the SLED is done by diffusion. There are newer machines which allow you to do what is called a SLED F, SLED filtration. But most of uh, ICUs in our country right now are doing only SLED, which uses only diffusion. In intermittent dialysis, we are trying to achieve solute balance in a very, very small amount of time. Therefore, the blood flow rate has to be high. In CRRT, we are taking our time 24 hours to do it slowly, so the blood flow can be very low. In SLED, it is going to be intermediate. Similarly, the dialysate flow has to be very high in intermittent dialysis, has to be moderate in SLED, and much less in CRRT. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Ultrafiltration, IHD will quickly remove fluid. 
quickly correct the solute. If you have severe hyperkalemia, dialysis will correct, correct it quickly. Hemodynamic in instability will more likely happen with dialysis because we are removing fluid in a very short period of time. It may be better with CRRT and SLED. And maybe I'll be able to fine tune my fluid control slowly, increase or decrease on an hourly basis in CRRT. SLED, not necessarily an hourly basis, but I still can have slightly better control than, than uh, in IHD. Remember that convection can be done only in CRRT. Therefore, removal of middle molecules happens only in CRRT and does not happen in SLED or IHD. So now going back to the question. The term dialysis refers to solute removal through convection. The answer is wrong. Dialysis means diffusion. The term hemofiltration refers to solute removal through diffusion. Again, wrong. Hemofiltration means convection. Fluid removal is always done by ultrafiltration is the right answer. Diffusive clearance provides equal efficacy in clearing small and middle molecules is wrong. We saw that diffusive clearance is not good in clearing middle molecules. Last, solute clearance by dialysis warrants fluid replacement. No, fluid replacement is warranted only when I do hemofiltration. So hope these concepts are very clear. Second question, low blood flow through the dialysis catheter affects dose delivery in IHD more than CRRT. It is difficult to diagnose dialysis catheter dysfunction while the patient is on dialysis. Rate of dialysis catheter dysfunction is higher in femoral site than internal jugular. Routine fibrinolytic locks are recommended to prevent dialysis catheter dysfunction. Recirculation increases dialysis dose delivery. I'll give you 10 seconds. So quickly, dialysis catheter dysfunction is very important because it is a major determinant of dialysis dose. The easiest way one will pick up the dialysis catheter dysfunction is frequent alarms in the dialysis machine, both on the arterial side and the venous side. And if one was measuring urea reduction ratio, which we will talk about later, you will see that your efficiency of reducing the urea will be much, much lower. Our goals for providing dialysis is very simple. I want to make sure that I avoid dialysis catheter dysfunction when I have a catheter. Therefore, I provide optimal dose. I want to minimize my internal thrombus and external thrombus of the catheter. I want to prevent catheter-related infections, and I want to avoid procedural complications. So when I place a dialysis catheter in the ICU as an intensivist, my goals are these four. So let's see what evidence we have. Like I said, the signs of catheter dysfunction are blood plump flow rates. Remember, we talked about blood flow rates of at least 300 ml for, for intermittent dialysis, for sled, it is 200 ml. So if I'm not able to achieve 300 ml, some people will say at least 150 ml, then we call it uh, dysfunction of the catheter. Arterial pressure alarm minus 250, venous pressure alarm more than plus 250, urea reduction ratio less than 65. I'm unable to aspirate blood. Frequent pressure alarms, not responsive to patient repositioning or catheter flushing. And generally a trend, as the pressure keeps on going up, then I know that this catheter is slowly getting thrombos and I need to be careful in terms of how to handle it. So how do I avoid catheter dysfunction if I'm going to put a catheter in somebody with AKI? People have compared different routes. This study looked at jugular versus femoral route and found that there was no difference between the two routes. But when they, when they looked at it carefully, it, it, they clearly found that catheter-related dysfunction was very high when, when the catheter site was left internal jugular. The right internal jugular and femoral did not have any significant differences. So try to avoid left IJ unless you really have uh, no other options, options to do so. So this is uh, one particular issue that we need to be careful about. Second, uh, this is a study they looked at how far should I insert the dialysis catheter. They looked at two positions, uh, right atrium SVC junction or SVC alone. They found that a deeper position, uh, right atrium SVC function was better and the catheter dysfunction was much lower in those patients than patients where the catheter was left in SVC. So based on the study, the recommendation is for the right IJ, you probably need to go in about 20 centimeters for a left IJ, you probably need to go in for 24 centimeters. Even for a femoral, you probably need to go in 24 centimeters. You need a longer catheter in femoral. 
In femoral, there is very good data to say that if the catheter length is less than 24 centimeters, then the chances of dialysis dysfunction is very, very high. And one other important issue about femoral catheters is that if somebody is obese with a body mass index of more than 28 and a half, the chances of infection go significantly higher and you need to be careful about those patients. So what kind of material is the catheter uh, made up of? You want the catheter to be rigid because unless it's rigid, it's not going to be easy to insert. But once it enters the body, it should be pliable. It should not be rigid anymore because if it is rigid, then it should uh, it will basically tear through the vessel. So that's the kind of material we're looking for. Silicon seems to be better than polyurethane. People have tried different kinds of lumen with varying results. The length I told you about external to internal diameter is important. You want the external diameter to be smaller, but the internal diameter to be maximum, which means the wall should be reasonably thin. Otherwise, you have a risk of clotting outside or inside. <clears throat> we'll talk about uh, rapid saline flushes are recommended before and after the dialysis to prevent catheter dysfunction. <coughs> Excuse me. Heparin coating has been attempted, but uh, uh, not very soundly. Recirculation. If the catheter length in the femoral is less than 24, recirculation uh, rates seem to be pretty high. I talked to you about the tip site also and the site of insertion. How do I manage? Try to change the patient position. Try to change the catheter position by uh, turning around. Fast feline slush pre and post dialysis. Rotate the catheter. If nothing worse, reverse the lumens. Make the arterial lumen into venous and venous lumen into arterial. <coughs> Understand this is only a temporizing measure because if you continuously change the catheter lumen for a long time, you're going to cause recirculation. People have looked for fibrinolytic locks, but it's not recommended. doesn't really seem to help. Uh, we'll talk about KTO or V later, but for now, uh, just leave it at that. And if nothing else works, you need to probably change the catheter as quick as possible. So the answer here would clearly be low blood flow through the dialysis catheter affects dose delivery in, in intermittent more than CRM. Remember, in intermittent, we have to reach a much higher blood flow compared to CRRT. So it's easier to cause catheter dysfunction and malfunction in an intermittent dialysis patient than a CRRT patient. <coughs> Next question. I'll give you 10 seconds for all of you to read through the question and then we'll go through the answer. Sorry. Okay, going on. So when do I initiate dialysis in the ICU? The problems with dialysis in the ICU are patients are already unstable, but they also have deranged homeostasis. They are all hypercatabolic with no steady state. They all need a lot of nutrition, a lot of volume from medications, including antibiotics, vasopressors. I need to dose the medications. Every time I dialyze and I cause hypotension, I'm going to impair the kidneys' recovery chances even more. So I have all those conflicting interests that are simultaneously happening in a critically ill patient. So the question is, how do I initiate or when do I initiate dialysis? So while there is increasing recognition of the value of earlier dialysis, the published consensus and the practice in many centers at present is still to apply dialysis to relatively ill rather than to relatively healthy patients. This sounds reasonably fair. We try to start it if somebody is sick earlier. Unfortunately, the statement was made in 1960 and our, uh, our uh, plan right now at the bedside is still pretty close to what the statement is from almost 60 years ago. So the problem is dialysis in the ICU, is it good or bad? The answer is yes, it is both good, it is both bad. That is why all of us have this dilemma of whether I should initiate dialysis or not. The good things are it restores homeostasis, it minimizes fluid overload, which we all know increases mortality in critically ill, allows for other support like nutrition, vasopressors to go. Who knows, it may actually improve mortality. The downside is I will worsen hemodynamic instability, which may worsen my AKA 
and also decrease my chances of recovery. And you could see all the problems related to vascular access we talked about earlier can add to the morbidity of the patient. So my first question as a clinician is, should I initiate dialysis? Or will the patient recover kidney functions on or his own? What is the reserve for the patient to handle any derangements in homeostasis if I continue to watch? And should I rather accept the risk of dialysis rather than allowing the patient to be in altered homeostasis? If I should start, when should I start? Should I start it as a preemptive therapy? Maybe he's going to develop acidosis soon, he's going to develop hyperkalemia soon. Should I start it now or should I do it as a rescue therapy? These are all the questions that practically we probably want to learn. So these are all the traditional indications for dialysis, refractory hyperkalemia, acidosis, volume overload, uremia, and some level of azotemia. Each nephrologist may have their own cutoff of how much urea and creatinine level they would target for dialysis. But at some point, all of us would agree that these are all very reasonable ways of uh, starting dialysis. But some may say these are all rescue. Uh, by, the time, by the time we start dialysis, at this point, it's already rescue and damage is already done. And probably we need to start dialysis a little bit earlier so that these damages does not happen. So early versus late dialysis was looked at several studies. The first four or five studies, they just looked at certain cutoff of urea. They arbitrarily picked a urea cutoff of, let's say, less than 70, more than 70, less than 100, more than 100, and saw what happened to patients. They seem to, you know, really did not show uh, much impact. Some studies showed maybe less urea was better compared to uh, waiting till urea goes up. The only randomized control trial was the Bauman trial, where they looked at uh, timing based on urine output. They looked at six hours of oliguria versus 12 hours of oliguria. It's a randomized control trial, single center trial, no benefit between early and late. So this was for many, many years, the, the preponderance of, of, of evidence for uh, several decades till further studies came by. But we know that urea alone is not maybe a good marker of timing of dialysis. <clears throat> In this study here, people showed that uh, the mean fluid balance is a marker of outcome. So if you wait for fluid overload, patient may die for every liter increase in fluid overload, there's a 15 to 20% chance of higher mortality in the study. Uh, in the PICARD study, people looked at the number of days of fluid overload and the degree of fluid overload. Both seem to impact survival. The more the fluid overload you die, the more number of days fluid overload you die. And CRRT probably gave you a way of decreasing the fluid overload earlier than intermittent dialysis in this particular study. And the study said that if you start dialysis after oligoanuria, acidosis, or other organ dysfunction, then it's probably too late. So it then becomes an issue where, when do I start? Now, if I wait long enough, people are saying it's too late. If I start early, how early should I start? So the first thing is, most of us would say, let's try something medical. The only evidence right now we have uh, that is substantial is the bicar study where patients were randomized to sodium bicarbonate. Uh, this is a 4.2% bicarbonate solution compared to the 8.4 we use in our country. The patients had infusions targeted for a pH of more than 7.3 or less than 7.3. The primary outcome was mortality plus more than or equal to one organ failure. That primary outcome was not different. But what was different is the need for dialysis and the time to dialysis was significantly less in patients who received bicarb infusion. So clearly, sodium bicarbonate can probably uh, push the need for dialysis a little bit longer. But remember, sodium bicarbonate will add on to the fluid overload. So you have to balance uh, one evil for the other. Then several studies came by looking at some particular stage of the AKI using either rifle criteria, KDI, GO criteria, uh, or AKN criteria. The first major study is the A-line study. <laughs> they all defined early versus late based on some kind of a staging. In this study, it was KDO2 versus KDO3 with an NGAL of more than 150. This study showed that early dialysis was better compared to late dialysis. The problem with this study was almost 90% of the patients were surgical and almost 50% of them were cardiothoracic patients. So a large amount of patients are not the kind of patients that you and me would see in the ICU. It was also a single center study making the validity not very extrapolatable to other centers. Second study was the AKK study. 
where they randomize patient again to do different stages of uh, AKI based on KDI GO criteria, they found that there was no difference in survival, 48 versus 49 between the two groups. What was very important in the study is in patients who got who were randomized to late dialysis, only 50% actually got dialyzed. Other 50% never needed dialysis. They survived and recovered their kidney function without needing dialysis versus in the early group, almost everybody got dialysis. So this makes you think whether by doing early dialysis, you're unnecessarily dialyzing a lot of people who have otherwise who would have otherwise uh, improved their kidney functions without any major uh, problems. The third study is the ideal ICU study. This is a study predominantly of medical patients with septic shock. Again, AKA rifle failure stage plus septic shock was most of the patients. No difference in survival between early and late. Again, in the late group, only 60% got dialysis. The 40% patients survived without dialysis compared to almost 97% in early dialysis group. So another study where uh, the late group, 40 to 50% of patients never got dialysed. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of all the studies together, looking at specific subgroup of surgical population, septic population, higher severity of illness versus lower severity of illness, previous kidney disease like lower GFR versus higher GFR. In, there was no difference between early and late in any of the subgroups, telling us that maybe early doesn't really matter. So what do we know so far? Early renal replacement therapy confers no survival benefit. 40 to 50% of patients in delayed groups actually get better without needing dialysis. Uh, in one of the studies, the fluid overload was almost three liter because it was pretty similar between the two groups. In one study, actually, the late group had a higher fluid, but still uh, we could not show survival benefit. But my, my concerns are that we may not be able to remove fluid in those sick patients and probably could not do much with the fluid overload anyway. When you cumulatively look at all the studies, there seems to be increased adverse effects uh, with dialysis in terms of increased uh, catheter-related bloodstream infection, hypotension, and hypophosphatemia. So how should we then define timing? Should I define it based on urea, time from ICU admission, rifle or AKN criteria, onset of degree of fluid overload, acidosis, or biomarkers? Looks like every one of those definitions does not give us an answer or does not conclusively tell us early versus late would be good. But then this pragmatic study came up uh, in the last three, four years. <coughs> this is the Lakmi Chawla study looking at the furosemide stress test. So when you give furosemide, it actually goes through the peritubular capillaries. Furosemide is a drug <coughs> which does not get filtered through the glomerulus. It goes through the peritubular capillaries, gets secreted into the proximal tubules, and goes down into the loop of Henle and acts in the sodium potassium 2 chloride pump and inhibits your sodium reabsorption causing diuresis. So <coughs> if I give a dose of diuretic like furosemide and the patient has a good urinary response, I can tell you that the perfusion is good because there is enough blood flow around the peritubular capillaries. The proximal tubular secretory capacity is good. Therefore, the furosemide gets into the tubule and the loop of Henle the concentrating ability in the medulla and the loop of Henle are intact. Therefore, diuresis is happening. So, uh, furosemide seems to act like a stress test to look at a lot of these small things that matter for renal function. And Dr. Lakmit Chawla said that if I can standardize the way we all give furosemide and have some kind of an ROC curve, it can probably help me prognosticate who will need dialysis and who will not. So, by giving frozomide, I know the proximal tubule is intact, proximal tubule is function, and thick ascending loop is also intact. So in this study, they basically derived a cutoff saying that if I give frozomide, the two-hour urine output should be 200 ml. If I make 200 ml of urine in two hours after a fixed dose of diuretic or Lasix, what dose of frozomide should be given? If the patient has never received frozomide before, they gave one milligram per kilo. So if you are a 70 kilo man, you got 70, 70 milligrams of frozomide, one bolus dose. If you have received frozomide within the previous 24 hours, uh, then you got 1.5 milligrams per kilo. So uh, that is the dose that was give it, given as a standard dose. Urine output was followed for two hours. If the urine output was less than 200 ml, absolute cutoff, they decided that uh, patient was not responder. If it is more than 200 ml, they decided that patient was a responder. Responder seemed seem to improve their kidney functions and need less dialysis. 
non responded non responders went on for dialysis increased mortality and and other other issues fst performed better than any one of the multiple biomarkers in the study you can see a whole bunch of urine and serum biomarkers fst had an area under the curve of 0.87 compared to everything else when fst was added to the biomarker it enhanced the value so there seems to be some kind of a rational for us to use uh, furosemide stress test in prognostication and deciding on timing of dialysis but understand that furosemide stress test should not be done unless the patient is definitely euvolemic and hemodynamically tolerant to the dose of furosemide i wouldn't be giving furosemide stress test in patients who are receiving two vasopressors you should not be giving a furosemide stress test in patient who are hypovolemic so make sure that those pre criteria are all established in patients who are eligible it may be an additional tool for us to decide when to dialyze patients so my perspective there's no consensus consensus on how to define timing on what optimal timing is no clear benefit in terms of early versus late risk of rrt has to be balanced with the likelihood of renal recovery host reserve to tolerate physiological derangements expected solute burden need for ongoing fluid input other organ failure and finally maybe in a, in appropriate candidates i'll be again repeating it to you appropriate candidates maybe use a standardized furosemide test and maybe help it uh, use it to help in the decision making so the answer here i would say none of the above statements are true question 4 which of the following statements best characterize rrt in the icu crrt is preferable in patients with acute liver failure crrt is less efficient per unit of time compared to intermittent crrt provides superior renal recovery and dialysis independence crrt has been consistently shown to preserve hemodynamic stability compared to ihd crrt has better outcome than slet i'll give you again 10 seconds <coughs> so this is the first study that compared peritoneal dialysis with uh, with continuous dialysis clearly showed that peritoneal dialysis was uh, had worse in mortality this was done in vietnam uh, they did manual exchanges the peritoneal catheters were very very rigid and uh, it was not an it was an open system which was conducive to infection so it was not a very technically very good peritoneal dialysis but that's what they could do so that kind of peritoneal dialysis definitely would be inferior to uh, any kind of regular dialysis at this point of time if you are in a setup where there is no other dialysis except peritoneal dialysis by all means use peritoneal dialysis a lot of uh, rural areas use peritoneal dialysis for snake bite induced aki because that's very easily available and very effective Uh, but if you are in a center where you have other modalities of dialysis then stay away from peritoneal dialysis this is the largest randomized controlled trial looking at intermittent versus continuous dialysis it's a french multi center study found no difference hemodiaph study found no difference between uh, intermittent and continuous the average dialysis duration here was almost 6 hours so it was almost like sled so they basically saying there was no difference between sled versus uh, crrt this is uh, meta analysis uh, again pulling all the studies including the previous study i showed you no difference between intermittent and continuous in terms of uh, any kind of outcomes this is there is one meta analysis again comparing sled versus crrt uh, about 17 studies have been included no difference between either in terms of either mortality or renal recovery between sled and crrt there is a subgroup of patients uh, or or a, a small uh, retrospective analysis of uh, studies post hoc analysis of studies showed that if the first mode of dialysis was crrt patients seem to recover their renal functions faster and have better survival so this had to be tested in a larger database so uh, people looked at it from a meta analysis point of view and found that uh, whether it was I, intermittent was a sled there was no difference in terms of hospital length of stay or mortality between the two groups in this particular study the number of patients who recovered the renal functions was higher when crrt was used at 90 days but at the end of one year there was no difference between the two groups so looks like long term there seems to be no difference between whether you get started on crrt or ihd in terms of renal recovery at this point of time there is no major convincing evidence telling us otherwise what about patients with liver failure there are several case series not randomized control trials basically saying that 
continuous hemofiltration may be friendly in terms of ICP fluctuations. In acute liver failure patients who have increased intracranial pressure, you don't want to be causing too much hemodynamic or osmotic uh, changes causing ICP changes. That way, uh, CRRT may be beneficial in patients with ALF. So how do I choose my modality? I think about the hemodynamics, the current status and the trend the hemodynamics has been uh, taking. What is the baseline renal function? What is my primary reason for dialysis? Is it for me for acute hyperkalemia or a drug toxicity, in which case I probably have to go for intermittent therapy quickly? Or if it's for fluid overload, uh, hemodynamic, in a hemodynamically unstable patient, acidosis, hyperkalemia, multiple indications, then maybe CRRT may be worthwhile. I need to uh, weigh the cost implications and logistics. So most of us have now gone towards hybrid therapies like SLED. In very sick patients, probably we go to CRRT. I would favor CRRT in a specific subgroup of patients, severe hemodynamic instability, somebody who's on at least two vasopressors and very tenuous, probably you're better off starting with CRRT, stabilizing them and then switching over to uh, hybrid therapies. Patients with raised ICP, acute liver failure, definitely CRRT. When fluid removal is not tolerated, I've already tried intermittent hemodialysis or SLED and I'm unable to remove fluid as much as I want because patient's hemodynamics does not allow, then I would do that. And there are some patients who need tight metabolic control. Their reserve is very poor and their demand is very high. So I rather keep up with it on a continuous basis than allow it to fluctuate. So those are the patients I would do CRRT than do hybrid therapies. So the answer here would be CRRT is preferable in patients with acute liver failure. It is CRRT is less efficient per unit of time. Remember that in intermittent dialysis, you are going to remove solute and solvent in three hours. That is going to take 24 hours in CRRT. So clearly CRR, uh, uh, CRRT is per minute or per hour is less efficient compared to intermittent dialysis. Next question. Everyday dialysis seems to be better than three times a week dialysis. Higher doses of CRRT are more beneficial in ICU patients. A recommended dose per treatment of IHD in AKI is at least 1.1. Recommended dose of CRRT in the ICU is 35 ml per kilo per hour. CRRT dose is calculated by calculating the total effluent rate. <coughs> so how do I uh, think about dosing in uh, acute kidney injury? For intermittent dialysis, we calculate what is called a KT over V. K is the uh, constant that comes with the membrane. T is the time. V is the volume of distribution. So there are various ways you can measure the KT over V. But right now, KT over V seems to be the consensus by which uh, dialysis dose is described for intermittent dialysis. For CRRT, uh, for predominantly urea and creatinine, uh, they, ex they go across the membrane one to one. Therefore, if you, by ML to ML, creatinine will come out. Therefore, the creatinine clearance is going to be the amount of ML coming out of the effluent. And therefore, the effluent rate would be the dialysis dose in these patients. So we will talk about uh, the pre and post and uh, reduction in membrane permeability. So what about the dose of dialysis? Uh, there are several studies. The first is the Schiffel study, which we will talk a little bit in detail later. Schiffel study basically looked at uh, intermittent dialysis daily versus alternate days, showed that daily was better. Subsequently, Ronco did a, multi, a single center study looking at CRRT 25 versus 35 versus 45. He found that 25 was inferior to 35, but 35 and 45 are equivalent. Based on that, Ronco said that we should at least give about 35 ml per kilo per hour of dialysis dose. This was a single center study. Subsequently, two major randomized studies, one in Australia and one in the US, the renal in Australia and ATE in US, randomized patients to high dose versus low dose. They randomized patients to 25 versus 35. They found no difference. ATN was a two by two design where they actually randomized patients to intermittent dialysis or continuous intermittent daily or intermittent alternate dose and uh, continuous 25 versus 35. Irrespective of intermittent or continuous, more aggressive dialysis did not change the outcomes in the ATN trial. 
So this is the original Schiffel's trial. The problem with the Schiffel trial is if you look at the prescribed KT over is 1.2. The current recommendation is we don't have recommendations for AKI, but in CKD, the KT over V prescribed should be around 1.2. We generally do not uh, calculate a KT over V. Most of us just go by the amount of uh, azotemia control based on blood work. But uh, for research purposes, if you do want, you can calculate KT over V should be at least 1.2 in AKA, at least 1.2 in AKA. And they were delivering only about 0.9. So basically in this study, they were delivering uh, a suboptimal dose more frequently versus a suboptimal dose less frequently. Also, they were removing large amount of fluid. If you do it alternate day dialysis, you're removing three and a half liters of fluid. Somebody may not tolerate it compared to only 1.2 liters. So the original Schiffel study probably does not really help us to tell uh, what dose should be given. So based on the majority of the evidence, higher dose is not superior to the conventional dosing. In intermittent dialysis, we do not particularly calculate a KT over V, but for the exam purposes, you need to know that a minimum KT over V of 1.2 is what is recommended. We generally dose empirically. We want to maintain urea levels 50 to 100. We want to maintain adequate homeostasis and we try to remove fluid as much as tolerated based on the clinical needs. Our frequency generally is three to six times uh, based on our logistics and the patient's demands. CRRT 25 ml per kilo per hour is as good as 35 ml per kilo per hour. And pretty much this is what we do. And uh, we need to understand that CRRT is not continuous all the time. Patients get interrupted. So the dose we actually deliver may be substantially lower than the dose that is prescribed. So you need to be careful. Maybe prescribe a slightly higher dose, maybe around 30 ml per kilo so that you will make up for whatever time lost. And if necessary, we go beyond these additional conventional doses for patients who are hypercatabolic. So here the answer I would say is CRRT dose is calculated by calculating the total effluent rate. All the other statements are wrong. Next question, pre-dilution CRRT augments the dose delivered. Post-dilution CRRT increases the filtration fraction. Dialysis dose delivered in post-dilution is lower than pre-dilution for the same prescription. Pre-dilution replacement fluid infusion decreases filter lifespan lower the filtration fraction, lower the filter life. Okay, just a term again, going back to pre and post dilution. Pre dilution means the replacement fluid is going before the dialysate. Post dilution before the dialysis filter. Post dilution means replacement fluid is going beyond the uh, dialysis filter. So now let's just listen carefully. What happens in pre dilution is I'm going to give a liter of fluid to the blood before it enters the dialysis filter. I'm going to be diluting the blood by one liter, which means let's say my urea level was 200. But the blood entering the dialysis filter does not have a urea of 200 because I've already diluted it by one liter. So what effectively will happen is this will decrease my clearance of my urea because I'm diluting the urea before sending it into the filter. So pre-dilution replacement fluid will always impair your clearance. On the other hand, because I'm giving one liter of fluid additional before it enters the filter, the filter is constantly getting flushed. Therefore, the filter life can probably become much better in this situation. Now, contrast it to post-dilution. Here, nothing is happening. My blood urea level was 200. Going into the filter is 200. I'm only giving a liter of uh, fluid before it enters the patient. But what is happening is every time the blood enters the filter, one liter of fluid is removed and there is hemoconcentration that is happening. If this hemoconcentration happens first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, fourth cycle, then the blood is going to get really thick and that would impair completely uh, impair the flow and completely clot off the filter. So we have to watch what is called the filtration fraction. Filtration fraction is the amount of water I remove each time I, I pass through I pass the blood through the filter. So pre and post both have their advantages and disadvantage. In pre, I dilute 
because of that i lose my clearance almost 15% but i reduce the filter clotting and prolong the filter life okay because i am reducing my clearance i need to do more ultra filtration for effective solute removal more replacement fluid and i also need to increase the blood flow to compensate for my lack of, uh, loss of efficiency post dilution no loss in efficiency therefore uh, i can probably use less replacement fluid but i can probably clot off the filter i may need increase anticoagulation methods what you also need to know is all the studies i quoted so far the ronco study the renal and atn all did post dilution crrt so the dosing they talk about is the post dilution uh, dosing most of our icus do pre dilution nowadays people have started combining pre and post to give 30% of the uh, fluid pre dilution 70% of the fluid post dilution so that they can get advantages of both it gets more and more complex and cumbersome for the bedside nurses so like i told you you need to be watching the filtration fraction which is the amount of plasma water that is filtered every time it passes through the dialysis catheter uh, we don't have to sit and measure it it's just for you to understand the concept the last thing you need to understand is also about the regional citrate anticoagulation because sometimes we may not be able to give systematic systemic anticoagulation to patients with crrt we may have to do regional anticoagulation what we here do is before the blood enters the filter they are going to add a citrate solution the citrate is going to chelate the calcium so as the blood is going inside the filter the the blood has a serum uh, ionized calcium level of like 0.3 to 0.5 which is like less than 50% of your serum ionized calcium therefore the filter is not clotting but since you are depleting the blood of calcium before the blood enters the patient we have to infuse calcium uh, gluconate it can be done through acute or through an iv line into the patient therefore the patient serum calcium is maintained so what we would do is we would target a post filter circuit ionized calcium of 0.3 to 0.5 versus serum calcium in the patient should be ionized calcium should be 1.1 to 1.25 most of the citrate will going to chelate the calcium almost 40 to 60% of the calcium citrate complex basically uh, comes out in the ultra filtrate the rest goes into the patient where the citrate has to be metabolized in the liver to bicarbonate if patient's liver is completely down then there is a chance that you one can develop citrate toxicity and uh, uh, problems related to that this study randomized patients to regional citrate anticoagulation versus systemic heparin clearly showed that the lifespan of the filter was better when uh, regional citrate anticoagulation was used so the answer here would be post dilution crrt increases the filtration fraction okay i think this is the last question 40 year old patient with copd admitted to the icu with comminuted acquired pneumonia and septic shock on day 2 developed severe oligoaneuria and acidosis and then started on renal replacement therapy he makes 100 ml per day of urine his family doctor who visits him insists on hitting him with lasix to get him off dialysis faster which of the following statements is the correct response to his suggestion we can give one dose of 300 mg of lasix iv bolus dose will drop his bp hence we can start him on lasix infusion at 25 mg per hour lasix does not decrease the number of dialysis sessions or time on dialysis torsamide rather than furosemide has been shown useful in terminating dialysis so how do we terminate somebody of dialysis people have tried uh, giving high dose furosemide to try to get people off dialysis in this study people have uh, give, been given 25 mg per kilo per day iv or 35 mg per kilo per day oral this is like industrial doses of diuretic they found that there was absolutely no difference in mortality dialysis sessions or time on dialysis so it probably doesn't matter and uh, this is the best kidney study which is a prospective observational study looking at how renal replacement therapy is provided across the world so in their database they took the patients who are on crrt there were about 530 patients they looked at all the patients who had successful discontinuation of crrt they found that two important predictors of uh, uh, weaning of crrt were urine output in the previous 24 hours and serum creatinine and if you give furosemide and the urine output suddenly goes up then the utility of urine output to to predict who will come off crrt goes down substantially because you are altering the urine output now it is of no value 
for you to be able to tell whether somebody will come off dialysis or not. So this is what it showed. You can see that urine, uh, urine output at a decent ROC curve without diuretics. Moment you give diuretics, the value of the ROC curve goes down. So the answer here is uh, furosemide does not decrease the number of dialysis sessions or time on dialysis. So termination of dialysis, no proven methods exist. Most of us still will follow the urine output being the most significant predictor of successful RRT termination. In intermittent dialysis, we look at the intradialytic urine volume and serum, urea, and creatin. But the problem is sometimes you can have rebound phenomenon after the dialysis. Uh, and we can probably decrease the frequency of dialysis and see if the patient is able to tolerate. In CRRT patients, when they start making urine, maybe we start uh, uh, thinking about weaning off CRRT or when the hemodynamics get better, switch them to a different mode of dialysis and then continue to watch them like you would watch a uh, intermittent therapy. And remember, furosemide is not of much use to try to terminate renal replacement therapy. So to conclude my talk, there's no clear consensus on how to define timing of acute kidney injury. Early initiation offers no outcome benefits. No one modality has been shown to be superior. Uh, high dose seems to, does not impact outcomes substantially compared to the conventional doses. Regional citrate anticoagulation definitely uh, prolongs filter life if we know how to do it. Urine output seems to be one of the good predictors of who would come off dialysis faster. People have also tried to do furosemide stress test as a marker of weaning dialysis, but the evidence is not strong as much as for its use in predicting the uh, progress of AKI and need for dialysis. And no role for diuretics to enhance renal recovery or hasten uh, termination of dialysis. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank Hello. you. Thank you very much, sir. It was indeed a wonderful lecture and a lot of concepts got cleared, I guess. I mean, there were a lot of misconceptions <clears throat> using diuretics inadvertently. I think you, we will try to avoid unless the patient is hydrated, well and hemodynamically stable. So, Brother, you would like to ask a question. Yeah. There are two questions in the chat box. Sir. Yes, sir. sir there are uh, two or three questions. Basically, one is the evidence regarding the furosemide uh, test test. And uh, what is the evidence, say, sir? Whether it is a harm, <coughs> there is no... Sir, uh, sir, as I, said, that's, I quote to the first study, the uh, Lakmit Chawla study is the first study for the furosemide test test. Like I said, make sure patient is uh, uvolemic and volume replete no significant hemodynamic instability. Uh, most studies would say a norepinephrine dose of less than 10 mics per minute is acceptable. Anything more than that or two vasopressors generally you should stay away from giving furosemide stress test because you can make the hypotension worse and affect uh, outcomes further. So generally, those are the rules. And uh, more and more studies seem to think that it's a good way to tell who's going to... Most of the studies have done in AKA stage one, early stage. Once patients start getting into AKA, Maybe try that. If, if the patient has a good response, maybe you can wait, knowing well that this patient has a higher chance of recovery compared to somebody who's not responding to frozomite stress test. So it's being used in several populations and uh, there are more studies coming out now on FST. So something to look out for. And we do use it whenever it's possible in our ICU. Uh, probably give one milligram per kilo dose when possible. If I think patient will tolerate that dose and then 200 ml urine output in the next two hours if the patient uh, makes good. Uh, if not, then, and, and the metabolic abnormalities are bad, I probably would uh, go for dialysis earlier than later. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the other question is like, uh, suppose uh, uh, from Dr. Masood, whether the pre-dilution is better in CVVH, you have means what is your opinion, sir? We all do pre-dilution. Uh, in my in our ICU, we do pre pre-dilution. Uh, the reason we do pre-dilution in our ICU is we do not use anticoagulation. Because we do not use anticoagulation, we use pre-dilution because it's a way to save the filter longer for cost purposes. And uh, that's the main reason. We do know that our delivery efficiency goes down by 15%, but that's no, we try to accept it if necessary, do other things to increase the clearance by increasing the blood flow or other things. But uh, 
by most part we do pre dilution so you avoid using either heparin or uh, citrate in such situations uh, when you are using citrate. yeah so uh, you are using how much is it dose that any, you are in our icu we don't use any anticoagulation that's how we have been doing crrt for many years when the system clots repeatedly we used to use uh, heparin very rarely see most of our patients are anyway coagulopathic that uh, they probably don't clot it that that frequently uh, and they are already bleeding or oozing somewhere so we have to be careful in patients where the system clots repeatedly we have used systemic iv heparin we have uh, tried regional citrate anticoagulation but the cost benefit ratio for our icu seems to be not very favorable and the reason i i say that is that most patients who need crrt in our icu will need it for about 24 to 48 hours one they get better or they either don't make it that far if they get reasonably better we immediately transition them to over to sled so it's a matter of using one filter uh, regional citrate anticoagulation for us in a cost effective way one we probably our nurses are not very well trained to we have to monitor calcium we have to monitor abg we have to monitor so many things if you put add on all those costs together the cost benefit we get on the filter lifespan may not be too great in our center i am only talking about our center we did some pilot studies uh, and that's where we left it if somebody needs crrt for a long time uh, say more than a week or so then maybe at some point after the first filter we may have to think of starting uh, citrate anticoagulation but the evidence is very clear if you are a center who can afford to do citrate anticoagulation uh, the fluid uh, uh, the filter lives will be longer with citrate anticoagulation for sure uh, do you i mean there are i mean uh, i have seen uh, like people feel like if the patient is not passing urine a uh, lot of circumstances have been i mean you know observed where i have observed like people use albumin and then after that they use diuretic so do you recommend this concept or i mean what so are you before talking? before dialysis you mean yeah before dialysis if you want to avoid dialysis I mean, yeah. there are some circumstances yeah. like so i i will just also come up and he will advise you albumin and then give lactic acid challenge and see and all that so this is, is this also a part of your prosomite challenge test or i mean no. is, is it in prosomite challenge test uh, i give okay let's take two different questions one albumin is lasix versus prosomite challenge test in prosomite challenge test i just give 1 mg per kilo of prosomite and then see the response and move on like i told you albumin with prosomite the rationale is not it's, it's not they're giving albumin pulling fluid from outside to inside and then uh, trying to diuse you that is not how it works there are a few studies that showed that your urine output does go up and the reason for that is uh, uh, in uh, critical illness there's a lot of third spacing that happens if you are hypoalbuminemic i give you furosemide you leak you leak everywhere and the amount of furosemide you reach into the peritubular capillaries is going to be extremely small and remember that furosemide is a very protein bound drug so if i give albumin in a hypoalbuminemic patient along with furosemide my chances of furosemide reaching a good concentration in the proximal tubules is very very high if i am hypoalbuminemic then uh, if i give furosemide it may not reach adequate concentrations inside the tubule for me to see a diuretic response so that is actually the logic behind it and studies have shown increase urine output so frankly uh, my bias is i will not use albumin unless somebody is hypoalbuminemic my cut off of hypoalbuminemia for this purpose is 3 somebody's albumin is less than 3 grams per deciliter and i need to give diuretics and i want to make sure it works well i give it along not one after the other i give it along i give albumin followed by uh, the furosemide right away that's what i do for the furosemide test or stress test i generally don't so is there any sir protocol like starting the lasix infusion in the furosemide test test after giving a bolus of oh, lasix no furosemide test test is a single bolus dose of 1 mg per kilo or 1.5 mg per kilo at end of 2 hours you see the urine output response if you think patient is responding to furosemide and you want to continue diuretic after that you can do whatever you want but the test stops at 2 hours you give one dose How? you know put at 2 hours and the test stops after that you do whatever you think is 
clinically appropriate for that patient whether you want to start an infusion or uh, or you want to give back fluids do whatever you think is appropriate right sir so one uh, interesting question by dr kavita she is asking which book to read for uh, renal replacement therapy particularly for icu patients which book to read for renal replacement yes. therapy no yeah. I, i would say the safest answer i can probably tell you is the uh, iscm book that they have come up with manual i'm sure it has a very condensed uh, what you need for the exam in terms of renal replacement therapy but if you want to learn more of the nuances i would suggest uh, uh, multiple review articles are out there uh, uh, if you just search several review articles are out there that address a lot of those concepts that i have uh, gone over and i would just uh, point them to you if you want i can probably email doctors one or two articles that i have and they can share it with the crowd in the next class thank you sir thank you thank you sir another question is like in hemodynamically unstable patient do you always recommend to start with crt because most of the centers they don't have this crt facility so uh-huh. how they can so there's, there is no evidence to say crt is actually better than sled in hemodynamically unstable patients it is all you no know, uh, our fear even in our center even though there is no evidence when somebody is on two vasopressors nor adrenaline of 25 mics and vasopressin most of us would say it is since we have the ability it is only wise to start crt make sure it is safe and then go but even in one of our own satellite hospitals uh, one of the nephrologists starts everybody on sled first he doesn't start on crt irrespective of how sick the patient is so if you are comfortable the way you are able to do dialysis in your center there is no evidence to say crt is superior to sled in terms of hemodynamic stability so you can by all means do sled if that is available but is there any technical difference between sled in such type of patient like slow ultrafiltration or there are a lot of things you can do uh, to intermittent dialysis and sled to be hemodynamic friendly like uh, like you said the rate of ultrafiltration is the easiest thing you can do the sodium the dialysate the calcium in the dialysate the temperature of the dialysate so you can keep going on lot of small small tricks people can do like uh, people also give albumin as you start dialysis so that you can keep the blood pressure up so lot of those simple tricks can be done if you are desperate and you need to get started do you recommend uh, peritoneal dialysis in acute uh... no like if you have period. other uh, more modalities of dialysis i would not recommend peritoneal dialysis if you are in a remote area where you have absolutely no access for dialysis pd is the only way then go for it and how about the uh, lasix as a continuous infusion versus bolus dose any difference as far as the efficacy is concerned uh, do you have no any- no evidence evidence wise there is no evidence to say a bolus is better than infusion or infusion is better than bolus uh, most of us would say give a bolus followed by an infusion purely because uh, you need a threshold uh, dose uh, for la- for furosemide to act so just starting at 5 mg per hour may never reach the threshold dose in the tubule so start with the bolus and then if you either you can just continue with the frequent boluses or you can soon after the bolus start the infusion so that you can maintain the drug levels and the infusion allows you to titrate the dose of furosemide so that at the end of the day you are not surprised with how much see what happens is sometimes we say let's aim for a negative balance of 1 liter you give a furosemide bolus and then you see suddenly patient has put out 2 and 1/2 liters now you you don't know what to do or patient has put out only 200 ml so either way you are stuck if you have a furosemide bolus followed by an infusion there is a mechanism for you at least to titrate to control the amount of fluid you are going to remove because fluid overload is bad but too much re- removing too much fluid at any given point of time may also hurt a recovering patient so that way i feel uh, infusion may give you that extra option to titrate how you want to remove fluid but there is no evidence to support that and any cut off value of urea or creatinine sir like many of the nephrologists they want to wait till the creatinine goes to 5 6 and uh, they start with our cluster. center we generally say urea i mean not mine most of our nephrologists will say somewhere around 250 if there is no other indication i'm going to be very clear if the patient has got no acidosis no fluid overload no hypernatremia and you're only worried about azotemia somewhere around 250 to 300 i think we'll start getting people nervous and they'll start dialysis but most of the patients in icu have more than one indication they already are fluid overloaded they already have hyperkalemia acidosis in those patients uh, we generally start much earlier no, 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 just trying yeah 
there is one more question on uh, chat box like uh, which are the conditions where we will choose cvbsd uh, or cvbh or cvbsd f okay there is one question uh, okay. like so by, by default by default uh, all the three main studies renal atn and ronco study all of them use cvbhd f dia filtration both dialysis and convection both was used there is still a school of thought that believes that adding convective clearance brings something extra than only a diffusive clearance so by default most icus now even in india start off with doing only cvvhd f there is no direct comparison of cvvh versus cvvhd versus cvvhd f for e for equal doses but most of most of our icus will do cvvhdf because the three major studies have used it people believe that convection brings something more than uh, something more than just diffusive clearance and for all practical purposes in our icu we do 50 50 say for example our effluent rate is 2 liters it will be 1 liter of dialysate and 1 liter of ultrafiltrate so for a 70 kilo man that's 2 liters already so almost 30 ml per kilo so that's what we do and if you think your solute clearance needs to be more aggressive then you can increase your ultrafiltrate or uh, dialysis most of the time what we will do is we'll keep the dialysate the same and increase the ultrafiltrate so uh, just the basic principle of drug dosing in uh, crrt and slate for the our dnb students uh, the I, i let me be practical about it so we can talk about a lot on drug dosing in dialysis with various things crrt at least lot of drugs have been evaluated in crrt so uh, the usual thumb rule is most people will assume a creatinine clearance of somewhere around 30 ml per minute as a gfr for uh, crrt on an average just a, a rule of thumb kind of a thing so i would just use that kind of a creatinine clearance for drug dosing the easiest thing i could probably say is open a book which has a table which tells you what dose to use for crrt patient and use the right dose for that particular patient because there are so many changes that happens to the pharmacokinetics dialysis is only one of them right they may have liver failure and they may have hypoalbuminemia protein binding may change now they may have other enzyme inducers that are there from other drugs drug interaction so uh, i would just not look only at crrt look at all those things but from the crrt point of view the easiest to look at one of those tables there is one more question in the chat box as to i mean how long you can continue crrt whether we should use uh, wait for some intrinsic uh, activity of the kidneys or any, no. any other parameter so i would any, use crrt any, till i need crrt if i think the patient is stable enough to tolerate sled i will move on to sled quickly because it's cheaper it is easily available and uh, it is cost effective and it is e uh, equally efficacious compared to crrt so uh, uh, most of the time what we end up needing is uh, crrt for 48 to 72 hours by then generally patient gets reasonably stabilized enough to switch over to uh, sled therapy sir nowadays a lot of uh, this uh, your uh, sled machines are also have the facility to do the this crrt with a specific uh, this circuit and other things like they can extend the time duration of the sled up to 24 hours so sir is there any comparison between crrt machine versus such kind of Uh, no see uh, I, i i don't believe in sled doing it for 24 when do when you do sled for 24 hours it becomes continuous because you are technically doing the same thing whatever name you want to call it people are doing what is called sled df self filtration but that uh, technically the way it should be done is you need what is called an online uh, uh, fluids uh, ultra filtrate coming in meaning from a pipeline you should be able to get replacement fluid almost no icu in india has that kind of facility so we don't do sled up we do only sled you can be extend the sled however you want based on your uh, uh, your logistics most of us would do it for 6 to 8 hours i think beyond that you are better off doing crrt right right sir another question is like suppose the urea and creatinine doesn't get clear out after the crrt or sled so what is what is the most probable cause most of the times we see like after sled also the urea and creatinine doesn't go down significantly so is there any look for, look for recirculation most commonly i would look for recirculation as the cause and that is one cause for dialysis dysfunction i told you about the urea reduction ratio the uh, uh, post filter urea pre filter urea uh, 
there should be a 60% reduction, uh, at least. If the, six, the reduction is less than 60%, that's an indicator for dialysis catheter dysfunction, and maybe it's time to, for you to consider changing the catheter. So uh, I think, sir, all the questions are over. So uh, wonderful talk. And thank really, you. thank you from our side, sir. And thank you. Thank you so much. This is basically an eye-opener to all the students and very lucid and in a nice way you have described. And from our side, uh, we would like to have more and more such lectures on dialysis or renal replacement therapy from your side. Sure. So thank you. Thank you from thank everybody, you so sir. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank bye. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye.